Hey, hey guys, welcome back to We Watch Movie. I am Mike, and we are deep in the shit now with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the franchise. I mean, deep in the shit, and all we have is a spoon and a Trisket cracker. All right, I know we've been quiet for a couple days, but we are still doing all the Texas Chainsaw Massacres leading up to Friday's review of the new movie. So make sure while you're here that you please click subscribe and click that little bell guy up there uh, to remind you of when we have movies coming out. And on Wednesday night, we'll be here with Jay live to do the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. So don't forget to back. Don't forget your baggins. <laughs> Man, you need to get your shit together. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, you look like this new KSC waitress they got, man. Don't know her ass from her elbow. <laughs> I feel like we're a little bit too late on the Nope trailer reaction to come out on the YouTube, but I am going to do one for it. That will be on the Patreon today. Uh, I'll put a link down to that in the description below. And uh, yeah, we also have our Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, the trailer reaction for this movie on the Patreon as well. Onto this fresh piece of poopy, Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 is not just an extremely long title that's going to be hard to fit into a YouTube title description. It also is a movie that is the threequel of this franchise, but almost completely just tries to get away from and pretend that the events of the first two movies did not happen whatsoever. Now, in the opening title card drop, it does mention a few things. It mentions that Sally Hardesty is now dead. She has passed away, and it mentions here that W.E. Sawyer was the only one captured and charged for what happened on that fateful night in Texas' ass crack. It makes no sense that they call him W.E. Sawyer, because his name in the movie is Drayton, but I think they just want to be confusing as shit, so they just did. And the cool thing is that he was on trial, and he ended up getting the gas chamber for what happened that night. But the court decided that Leatherface was just a personality that he had made up, that he would just put on people's faces, maybe a dress, maybe a rouge, maybe some panties, and would murder people, and that was just like an alternate personality, so they don't think Leatherface exists. Which is kind of a cool idea if you consider that that means Leatherface is just out here picking his butt in a cornfield somewhere, living his best life. So this guy we're gonna, who we're gonna call Billy the Blue Ranger the entire movie because he looks just like the Blue Ranger from Power Rangers, which makes me sorry for the Blue Ranger from Power Rangers because he's actually a cool guy. This guy is a total cock face McGregorton. He spends the whole time either being a complete douche from which there was no escape to his girlfriend or just whining about everything from his bugle boys being crammed up his panty hole to his great clips Jonathan Taylor Thomas haircut. He's just a, an annoying little bastard and I hate him. But they're traveling down the road and they come into Texas right when this mass grave has been found in Texas. And these dudes come out there in these hazmat suits and it is grotesque. The body parts they pull from the ground are just slimy. It looks like Godzilla ate a bunch of meth heads in Texas and then puked them back up. I mean, it is gross the way they show these bodies. Definitely the grossest thing in the film, which is surprising because the, the whole movie was cut to smithereens by the MPAA. Like this movie, the poor director Jeff Burr just got fucked left, right, front to back on this entire movie. The MPAA cut his movie down to shit. A lot of the kills are off screen. You can barely tell what's going on. The production company even went and redid the ending and did, he didn't know about it until he watched the movie in theaters. He was like, I didn't shoot that. They changed the ending of his film. They fired him and then nobody else would take the movie so they brought him back. I feel bad for Jeff Burr on this film. Let me just say that. They eventually, finally, they go to this gas station and there's this weird dude and he seems, he's his name's Alfredo. He's more like the characters we got in the other Texas Chainsaw Massacre films the really annoying over the top overacting some bitch just yeah they're coming back and get you you want it you want it yes you want it yeah yeah you want it yeah. they pull up to get gas he's being a fucking weirdo he's watching her through a peephole while she's taking a a, a poop in the, in the gas station or whatever and this is where Vigo Mortensen shows up and he's just standing there you know looking like handsome Vigo Mortensen and she's all about him because it's the first testosterone she smelled in months. But that's not good enough to get him a ride. Eventually, Billy the bitchy blue ranger comes out and says, no, we're not giving you a ride. They head on down the road. It seems like it takes way too long to get to this point. But finally, a truck shows up and attacks them while they're on the road. And it, somehow the driver, while driving, is also throwing full-sized 
dead wolves or huskies, I can never tell the difference, at their car. They get pulled over and Leatherface comes out of nowhere. And now Leatherface looks weird in this one. And we'll talk about the beginning of the movie in just a little bit. Uh, this, this is the second time he's actually shown. But this is the first time he's shown in his all of his glory. And you know, it's so dark, it's hard to see anything in this movie. Like, I don't know what is going on during the fight scenes and during everything, but it's just so damn dark. It's hard to capture what's going on. But he does show up, and he, he doesn't look that bad. He looks... He looks better and scarier than he did, I think, in part two, for sure. He kind of just looks like he was a member of Firehouse if Firehouse was a Slipknot cover band from West Virginia. I, I don't... <laughs> that's the best way I can explain that. And I can say that because I was born in West Virginia. But I think R. Hey Milohoff, or however you say his name, did a great job playing Leatherface in this one. I, 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 there was things about Leatherface I enjoyed. And definitely, I, I liked it better than the part two Leatherface, so fucking sue me. But yeah, he chops up their car and somehow manages not to kill either of them, even though they're standing helpless on the side of the road and they're both as useless as a poopy flavored fucking popsicle. The next thing you know, they're driving down the road and out of, out of nowhere, the worst car wreck scene in movie history maybe happens. I had rewound it twice and I still don't know what the hell happened, but at some point, both Vigo shows up pretending that he's on the side of the road bleeding and their car's come into contact with Ken Foray, who's Benny in this movie, who's a savior to this movie. This movie would not even be half as good as it was without Ken Foray in it, but we'll get to that. It's Ken for e goddamn, son, shit. Where'd you go to school, stupid? You fuck up macaroni and cheese, man. Goddamn. Ken Foray's an awesome actor, by the way. Super nice guy. We met him at Scarefest and had a cigarette with him once. He's nice. He was really good, and he was like, well, so he's like a doomsday prepper type dude, and he's out in the middle of nowhere, so he's got all this shit in his car. He's got all these guns and all this cool stuff that's going to help them survive the situation, but he helps them out of the car, and he helps them throughout the film deal with Leatherface and the Sawyer family that's coming out. Meanwhile, there's this little fucking girl who looks like Newt from Aliens 3 who's just there, and she's being weird as shit, and she's like, I ain't a rat! Shit! Her family's been killed by Leatherface, and she's a survivor, but she's all fucked up from it. Who the hell knows what she's even doing there? Uh, Leatherface kills her. Uh, so that's just the subplot that makes no damn sense. She's just there to die, I guess. The little girl's death is off screen because the M MPAA. Billy gets fucked up really bad because he gets caught in a bear trap. And then Leatherface runs up and he and he he double taps him with the chainsaw. But he somehow survives that. But we wouldn't know that because that was off screen too. We didn't see shit. We end up back at the house. And this is where things get a little bit different. But it's really just the same damn shit recreating the dinner scene and all that. We get back to the house. They go upstairs, there's a little girl there, and she's the little girl who's from the beginning of uh, Friday the 13th, the, the little telekinetic girl that killed her dad on accident in the beginning of the movie. Boom, surprise, she's Viggo Mortensen's daughter, or he's at least, they're in the same family. He shows up, they take her hostage, they redo the dinner scene. Uh, the only difference here is that acting is a little bit better, in my opinion, than in previous dinner scenes. Like, I found, if you know, if you watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 review, I find Chop Top really annoying and over the top and overacted. You got Vigo Mortensen playing Tex, so we all know Vigo's a great actor, even if his character's kind of weird here. You got Joe Unger from uh, the original Nightmare on Elm Street playing the character of Tinker, which is just another random brother that pops up. I thought he was really good in this, like, for, especially for, a, you know, Leatherface 3. I thought both the brothers were good. This time there's a mom who has one of those electric larynxes. Larynx? Lar larynx? Larn? Hey, has one of those electric voice boxes. There we go. Has one of those electric voice boxes. Grandpa's there, but this is literally the worst grandpa of the entire series. I mean, it's a party city stuffed head just sitting on top of what I'm pretty sure is just a dummy. It's just sitting there. I mean, it's just a, it's just a shit mask put on top of something with blood on it. It doesn't move. It doesn't look like it's supposed to move. It looks like a Halloween decoration. They didn't even try with the grandpa on this one. And that's saying something because some of the grandpas in this series aren't the best looking grandpas. That sounded weird. Y'all better watch out. This boy's out here trying to fuck your grandpas. <laughs> Seriously, man. I bet this boy couldn't draw a fucking stick figure playing with his dinghy. And you want to talk about special effects? Get the hell out of here. Shit. God damn. I bet you still sleep with your underwear on. And then yada, yada, yada. We're all cannibals. We're going to eat you. Maybe fuck you. You come to the realization that Leatherface has raped some girl that they got over there. And that's, he may be that little girl's dad. The little girl comes over and Leatherface gives her a kiss. There's some weird Leatherface shit going on here. Um, that's just an interesting side plot that's going on. But also, they show Leatherface in a different light in this movie. 
And that's one of the things I do like about it is that it gives us a little more leather face than the other two movies did. In this one, he's got a different personality almost completely in that he likes to collect things. Like when, when they kill people and shit, he takes their electronics. He's walking around with this cassette Walkman trying to make the girl listen to it. And when one of the guys takes it from him, he gets super fucking pissed. And he actually defends himself here. Like when Tinker throws his tape into the into the oven and burns it, he stops his ass and puts his hand in the fire and burns him and makes him pull it out himself. So there's a different personality going on with Leatherface a little bit here. There's a scene that's just batshit banana pie crazy where he's sitting there playing with like the speaking spell type thing that he's duct taped together. And it's trying to get him to answer the question, but all he can type in is the word food. And he types it in and it's like, sorry, that's the wrong answer. And he keeps getting frustrated because it's the only word he knows. And it's both sad and fucking adorable at the same time. You take that adorable bullshit and cram it right up your fucking cram hole, Lafleur. I play fucking Wordle, okay? I know tons of goddamn words. Chicken, spaghetti, sauce, uh, biscuits, uh, f water bottle, Texas, uh, 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 sh 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 sherbet, ice cream, uh, lick, uh, table, uh, saucer. <laughs> That's nine. That's fucking nine right there. Shit, what you got for me, son? <laughs> So about this time at the dinner table scene, thankfully Benny shows up with a machine gun and I mean, he just starts shooting every fucking thing just all over the place. I mean, this guy, what he did there and the innocent people were inside too. What he did there was basically the equivalent to just walking in like a Walmart rest restroom, putting your hands behind your neck, you know, pulling your dick out and just spinning around in circles, pissing on everything, but then somehow still getting some of it in the toilet. The funny part was that he literally pummeled grandpa's face in like, there was not even, he's so old and dusty, there's not even any goddamn blood. His face just went, <laughs> that fucking Michael Myers mask with the dudes eating chips. It just went, <laughs> that shit was funny. But yeah, he shows up, kills a bunch of people. And this is where this, the, the movie actually, I kind of was starting to enjoy it a little bit. Um, because of the music that's going on over top of it, the, that it turned into the, it felt more like an early 90s New Line film which is a little bit a change of pace from the other films that we've seen in this series. Ken Foray comes out and has a one-on-one -on -one fight scene with Tex. There's a cool scene where he misses him with an ax, hits a bunch of gas, and a bunch of gas pours all over Tex, and he lights him on fire. Then <laughs> he runs away, and he jumps as the truck explodes, and it looks like a scene in fucking Tango and Cash or something. We end up fighting, one-on-one, -on -one, we end up with Leatherface fighting Ken Foray's character, Benny, in this marsh, in this swamp or pond or whatever, and... Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, did you guys see the trailer for this before you watched it? Now, I did a trailer reaction for it on the Patreon, which is also in the link down below, because I'd never seen it before. And the trailer is one of the coolest fucking trailers in the history of the world, okay? It's just this dude standing by a lake, and this music's playing, and it looks like some river runs through it type shit. And all of a sudden, like, this, this beautiful chromed out chainsaw comes up from the water and it's like a gypsy's hand holding it right and then it just tosses the chainsaw up in the air and the dude that was just standing there all like beautiful next to the water grabs it and turns around and it's fucking leather face and this chainsaw is just gigantic beautiful chromed out chainsaw that says the Saul's family on it and Vigo got it for him uh, Tex got it for him as a gift in the movie so that's the chainsaw he's running around using coolest chainsaw in the history of movies I mean I've never fucking seen a chainsaw this cool in my life uh, so the movie gets a nod for that but also fun fact Kane Hodder did some of the stunts on this movie and he I found out is actually the one who played Leatherface in that trailer because they filmed it before they had a lick of film for the movie so that's just fun facts and my initial reaction to that again is in the link down below but so he's got this chainsaw they're fighting in the marsh and the chainsaw is just running around in the water like on its own just spinning around like a fucking shark you know it makes no goddamn sense but they're fighting and they have this fight scene and even though it's so damn dark you can barely see anything leatherface eventually pushes uh, benny against the chainsaw blades and we assume that yeah he's been ripped to, to, to shit he's dead uh, she hits Leatherface with a rock and it's daylight. She walks out into the road. You think it's the end of the movie? A truck pulls up and by God, Benny's alive. Benny's driving the truck. And he's just got like a mark on his head, even though we literally watched as he was ripped. I don't fucking know. That's maybe that's why they made it so dark. But what had happened was test audiences liked Ken Foray and they brought him back for that scene because they wanted to see him live. And again, the director was surprised by it when he watched it in theaters because he didn't even know that scene happened. 
Uh, but the dude, Alfredo, uh, who likes to look in the in the poo hole, or the, the hole that goes to the bathroom, I don't know, probably likes to look in poo-poo holes too. He shows back up, and he hits Benny over the head. She has a cool final girl moment where she gets to say something badass and blow him away with a shotgun. You see Leatherface walk into frame as they drive away. Boom, into the movie. You never see any of these fucking characters again except Leatherface, and it's all just completely a pointless exercise let me say this i enjoyed some parts of this movie surprisingly so i did like i thought some of the acting was a step up step up for sure i between vigo mortensen joe unger ken foray uh some good acting there's also some some really annoying characters still uh alfredo uh being one of them and uh the billy the fucking asshole ranger the whole electronics fascination and deeper strange kind of gonzo look into leatherface i liked i thought that was a neat touch I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the whole New Line Cinema feel to this. Like when the movie opens up, it opens up and it feels like it's in that Freddy Krueger universe because this is the only film uh, New Line Cinema did with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. Kind of a hat tip to A Nightmare on Elm Street, the opening where Freddy's working on his claws and this leather face is working on his mask with this little razor blade and he's making these little skin faces. He looks like Pauly uh, from Goodfellas cutting up the garlic when they get nipped and they're in prison. It gives it this whole feel like they really are in the same universe together. And and let me ask you guys a question as like the question of the day do you guys think like back in the 90s okay would you have liked to seen a, a version a, a, a crossover somehow between uh when new line had both between freddy and leatherface the reason it'd be interesting to me is because i would love to see freddy go into these fucking hillbillies dreams and like just fuck with him you imagine the one-liners that he could deliver to these psychos and on, on top of that imagine what leatherface's dreams must be like and how batshit that would be and how funny they could make that uh and and then you could have leatherface versus uh you know versus freddy and again like there are very very bad guys that we would enjoy watching freddy dispatch and then at the end it'd be freddy and leatherface i don't know to me that's a movie i would have liked to have seen back then uh but comment down below let me know what you guys think this channel fucking sucks man it fucking su i'm sorry i didn't mean that shit i'm just feeling a little down i spilled some my lunch my chunky noodle soup i went to get out of the microwave forgot how hot the, the bowl was and it scared me so I dropped it on my dingus, and I wasn't wearing no fucking pants, you see. I didn't get burnt too badly because I had somebody else's skin wrapped around it. Don't you worry about that. You mind your fucking business, all right? Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I, it still makes me sad to, to lose my chicken noodle soup. You know what I mean? That shit was chunky. And even though the continuity of the story made about as much sense as using a hair dryer in the shower, if some of the lines were delivered a little bit better by some of the, the, not so great actors in the movie and some things that played out differently i could see the writing here actually not being that bad there's a couple interesting ideas here that they're toying with and that makes sense because the guy that wrote this by the way is also the guy who adapted the crow all that being said the movie looks like it has the budget of a pack of ramen noodles i mean the editing is just broken you know the lighting is just terrible some of the acting is just terrible and we we went through all this to get away from the first two films just to end up doing the same dinner table bullshit again which makes no sense to me uh the choreography the direction some of the acting is just it has all the makings of one of those while it has that cool new line feel to it and you enjoy that at times it also has the makings of one of those weinstein dimension films where they just slopped some shit out uh, uh to to keep the rights you know, so it's a little bit of a mix between both of those. Uh, very studio interfered and all that. But at the end of the day, I'm going to give it five and a half. I'm going to give it five and a half, which is above an average score. And I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm shocked. But there are little things I enjoyed about it. And I would like to edit it myself and just watch like a 13 minute video uh, instead of having to ever watch the movie again. Um, but, and you probably could. Comment below, guys. Let me know what you guys think later. Very, very soon, we are also going to have a uh, part four of the next generations up next. And my thoughts on that, I think, will surprise the shit out of you. Uh, but I love your fucking faces, guys. Thanks for watching this. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. I'll see you fucks later. Them boys been whacking off in my two shit again. I mean, who the fuck wants to eat in the same vicinity as Chastity over here clapping her butt cheeks all through the air? You know, poo particles, they just fucking fly around. That shit lands right on that buffet. All right? I ain't putting that in my mouth, okay? You know what I mean? I've seen Outbreak. I know how that shit travels.